Good morning. I want to welcome you back to the Character Project Conference. Uh, we have some new faces that weren't able to come in last night, so we want to especially welcome you here this morning. It's my privilege to introduce the very first speaker for the 2012 Character Workshop, uh, Character Project Workshop, Dr. Christian Miller. Christian is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Wake Forest University. He's also Zachary T. Smith Faculty Fellow at Wake Forest University. The title of this talk this morning is Some Foundational Issues About Character. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Miller. Thank you, Josh. So good morning, everyone, and great to see you again. Uh, I'm going to dive right into this. and. Uh, but before, before I do, I'm gonna, I want to say something about the, uh, the topic for today. I was trying to think of some issues that would uh, relate to all the products we have here. Uh, it would be of interest to people uh, working on psychology, philosophy, and theology, products ranging from uh, war crimes to um, the virtue of modesty and Islam uh, to virtue of epistemology. So I came up with this, these set of issues. And I just say a, a few things about these issues, um, stressing that these are just some foundational issues and not making any claim about this being an exhaustive list here. So I want to identify a few basic conceptual and empirical issues about character, sketch some of the leading positions on these issues, and indicate what I think is the most reasonable position to adopt. Uh, another way to put that would be indicate what the truth is, but maybe. <laughs> Uh, humility, I guess, is supposed to be a virtue, too, so uh, what the most reasonable position is to adopt. This is going to be real quick. It's going to be sketchy. Only can do so much in 25 minutes, but uh, more details can be found in two forthcoming books, Moral Character and Empirical Theory, and Character and Moral Psychology. Can everyone see in the back? Is Not this... the bottom, couple lines. Not the bottom, couple lines. Okay, well, I know what I can do about that, so <laughs> other than just read it to you. Oh, those are very important lines. Well, okay. <laughs> um, and we have enough seats. I think so. Okay, good. So, moving on. Here are the issues. There are a lot of them. So, how in the world are we going to cover all this? By moving quickly. So, I'm not going to even read those. Let's just go to the first one. <laughs> what is character? Well, that one we can solve in two seconds. That's ridiculous, but here's a very preliminary, very... Uh, platitudinous answer to that question, what is character? I'll say a person's character primarily consists of his or her character traits and the relationships between them. So character is not just a matter of the character traits, it's also a matter of the relationships between those traits. Uh, examples of character traits would include obviously examples like honesty, compassion, and courage. So there we go, we've sorted out the big topic for the conference. Uh, on to the second issue. Are character traits the only traits there are? Well, I think this is an easy one to answer. Clearly not. Uh, so here's some simple examples of other traits, my hair color, my height. Uh, if we just think of traits as properties or features of things, then my hair color and my height are properties or features of me, but they're clearly not character traits. More interesting examples, uh, and infants, this is certainly more controversial ones too, an infant's trait of being cheerful, like my son's, my newborn son's trait of being cheerful, or an adult's genetically acquired and subsequently uncontrollable trait. You might think, and again, this is more controversial, you might think these count as traits for sure, but perhaps not as character traits. So for the first few set of issues here, I want to do some taxonomy and just talk about how to maybe slot and categorize uh, different kinds of traits. Then we'll go on to the next set of issues to talk about some metaphysical, and theor uh, metaphysical issues about traits from a philosophical perspective. And then the last set of issues, we'll get into the empirical stuff, and that's when I'll wake up the psychologist and tell him that the interesting stuff is happening. So, <laughs> but as far as that second issue is concerned, here's how I uh, taximize uh, the different uh, categories here. Traits is the broad notion. Uh, under that, I subdivide into personality traits and non-personality traits. So my height and weight and so forth go over here. On this side, uh, and uh, mental traits, traits of a being's mental life, go over here on the left side. And then I further uh, subdivide into character traits 
and non-character traits. Now this, again, is controversial. Some people just equate personality traits with character traits and think they're coextensive. Uh, I don't, uh, but I also recognize that it's quite hard to come up with a careful way of distinguishing between these two categories. Uh, one way of doing it is in terms of responsibility. You might think the character traits are those traits for which we are uh, uh, responsible and can be held appropriately responsible, but in the first instance are responsible, and the non-character traits are not. So an infant's trait of being uh, cheerful is a non-character trait in virtue of its being a trait for which the infant is not responsible. That's one approach among many, uh, and it has its strengths and weaknesses, and we can talk about that more in Q&A if you like. But this is just something to think about, how to tax them to organize the different kinds of traits. Third issue, our moral character traits. The stress here on this issue is the moral character traits like honesty, compassion, and heroism, the only character traits. So when we think just about the character traits, which we're doing at this conference, are they all only moral character traits? Well, again, this is a controversial question, uh, but my answer is not so controversial in my mind because I think the answer is clearly not. I think there are lots of other character traits besides the moral ones. I uh, restrict the, the moral fairly narrowly. Others construe the moral fairly broadly. But on a narrow conception, I think there are lots of examples of non-moral character traits. For example, aesthetic traits. Someone's artistic. That's a trait, <coughs> character trait, uh, something you can be held responsible for if you use that uh, way of going. But it's, in my mind, not a moral uh, character trait. Prudential traits, like being clever. <coughs> Epistemic traits, like being logical. Religious traits, perhaps, maybe the most controversial of these four, such as this trait of being reverential towards God. Uh, you might think of, uh, again, most controversially, but you might think of it as a non-moral trait. So for now, I'm only going to focus, and for the remainder of this talk, on the moral character traits. Again, paradigm examples would be honesty, compassion, courage, humility, temperance, as far as the virtues are concerned, and their respective vices uh, as well. So here's a, an updated uh, chart here. We've got the same categories on the, the first three levels, but then under the heading of character traits, I subdivide into moral character traits and non-moral character traits. And you might think that, that this category is bigger, more numerous than the category of moral character traits. But I think for the purposes of today, and I think for the purposes of most of the projects I'm familiar with, the focus is going to be here on the moral character traits. OK, moving on. Enough taxonomy. Now a little metaphysics. So we're focusing on the moral character traits. And I want to ask the question, what are they? What is their existence like? How should we understand them? And what I say here may or may not generalize to other traits, uh, uh, personality traits, sorry. Uh, but uh, that's a topic for another day. I'm just going to focus on the moral ones. In particular, are they causal dispositions in our minds which, when triggered, can give rise to relevant beliefs, desires, and bodily actions? So um, for those of you who are not familiar with this terminology, I'm just talking about dispositions in a fairly ordinary sense. Uh, what's 2 plus 7? All right, so have you thought about, <laughs> I was looking for a faster answer there. Uh, have you thought about what 2 plus 7 equals today? Not up to this point, presumably, right? <clears throat> but were you disposed to believe that 2 plus 7 equals 9? Yeah. Yes. So when you were even asleep last night, it's still true of you in one sense that you believe that 2 plus 7 equals 9 in the sense that you were disposed to believe that 2 plus 7 equals 9. Now, you didn't have what's called an occurrent belief, an active uh, conscious belief that you just had a moment ago when you asked yourself the question, what is 2 plus 7 equal? So that, that wasn't going on. That's an occurrence belief. But you had a disposition to believe that 2 plus 7 equals 9. And in the right situation, in the right context, that disposition gets triggered and gives rise to an occurrent belief, 2 plus 7 equals 9. Well, uh, that's just a, an analogy uh, to this question here. Uh, are character traits likewise to be understood as dispositions in our mind 
which we have <coughs> over the course of our lives and perhaps are not relevant uh, currently, are not active in many situations, but when appropriately triggered, lead to the formation of relevant beliefs, desires, and often bodily actions. And I'm going to say, <coughs> what do you think? <coughs> Yes. yes, all right, good, which is, <laughs> which is what you all should say, because that's the correct answer, that's the truth. Um, so the, the answer is yes. Here's an example to illustrate it in a little bit more detail. You can tell I'm not very savvy with PowerPoint. I'm a philosopher. Please forgive me, so I've used this kind of weird uh, diagram. Um, so maybe you can teach me how to do this better, but here's the idea with the uh, moral trait of compassion. <clears throat> you have the... Uh, disposition to form beliefs and desires which are constituents of the virtue of compassion. And when a relevant situation arises, you see someone in need of help, uh, that serves as a stimuli for that disposition, which can causally activate that disposition, provided their appropriate background conditions. We can talk more about that if you like. Uh, and that can give rise to a current, active, conscious, <coughs> beliefs and desires of a compassionate nature. You can start having desires to help that person. You can start uh, having beliefs currently, consciously in your mind, uh, and that you should help that person. It would be a good thing to help that person, or that person's in need. Like, I do something. And those beliefs and desires, in turn, can give rise to compassionate behavior. <clears throat> so the idea here, again, is we have, if we have a relevant character trait, like compassion, we have that as a disposition. It's part of our psychology, a part of our mental life. It's often not active, not doing much. Uh, if it's not a relevant situation, like when we're asleep, it's not doing much. It's just there. Uh, but in the relevant situations, relevant circumstances, it can be causally activated, give rise to a current beliefs and desires of a compassionate nature, which, again, in, provided the conditions are right, uh, can give rise to actual compassionate behavior. Not always, of course. <coughs> It might be there's weakness of will. It might be uh, external obstacles to actually behaving compassionately. Uh, someone might be putting a gun to your head and preventing you from, uh, in that way, acting compassionately. But uh, often, this uh, causal link will be there. So that's how I think of uh, uh, character traits on a metaphysical level, what they are uh, as causal dispositions in our psychology. Uh, it turns out to be quite a controversial view in psychology, and my experience in philosophy and theology is not so controversial. I think this is the predominant way of going, uh, popular way of going. In my uh, reading of the psychology literature, though, it's uh, just one of three approaches out there. I'll go through this very quickly. Another very popular approach is to say that character traits are just <coughs> actual patterns of relevant thoughts and actions. They're not causal dispositions. Uh, the trait of compassion just is <coughs> the collection of your compassionate thoughts and actions that you've, ex you've exhibited in the past. <clears throat> so you kind of sum those up together, and that's what compassion is. Uh, example, this is put in term semantic terms, in terms of what a statement means, but they, you could put this in metaphysical terms, in terms of what a trait actually is <clears throat> metaphysically. So it doesn't matter. Uh, for my purposes, as an illustration, uh, the statement, Mary is arrogant, means that over a period of observation, she has displayed a high frequency of arrogant acts relative to a norm for that category of acts. And certainly that's uh, relevant to, in my view, relevant to character traits, uh, certainly an aspect of character traits, but that's not fundamentally in my mind what character traits are. Uh, just to give a, a, a quick uh, argument against this, I think it's possible to have a character trait and never have it activated. So it seems possible to me. Someone could have a trait of heroism, for example, and throughout that person's entire life never be in a situation where uh, that trait is activated. So never exhibit relevant thoughts or actions, <clears throat> but still have the trait. So I don't think this is, gets to the, the heart of the matter, uh, despite the popularity of the, the view, the act frequency view in psychology. Another view, just mentioned briefly, uh, conditional view character traits are just patterns of relevant thoughts and actions that would be exhibited in the relevant circumstances. This is a conditional, a counterfactual approach to character traits. Again, I don't think this gets to the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, ca character traits are causal dispositions in our psychological lives. 
that <coughs> explain uh, relevant actual behavior <coughs> and ground the truth of counterfactual conditional behavior, explain uh, why it is <coughs> that these conditionals are true, uh, but uh, neither of these views seem to me to uh, get to the heart of the matter of what character traits are. So, <coughs> psychologists, we're almost there. <coughs> I'll tell you when to wake up in a second. If character traits exist in our minds as dispositional properties, which I think we should agree they do, well, what exactly are they? So beliefs are familiar. Desires are familiar. Emotions are familiar to us and from our own experience. But now I'm saying that in our minds there are also these things called character traits, like honesty. And that might strike you as mysterious. It's just strange how, uh, what, where, what would they be? Are they floating around in our minds distinctly from these other more familiar mental states? Uh, is this going to be something problematic to buy into? Uh, and spooky, as philosophers, that's a, that's a philosophical word, spooky, um, as philosophers like to use. Mysterious, um, well, I don't think so. But here are two positions, and I'll tell you which one I like better. Uh, one position to say, to answer the question, what exactly are they, is to just say they're just identical to <coughs> dispositions to form beliefs and desires. <coughs> so uh, the trait of compassion is just identical to <coughs> dispositions to form compassionate beliefs and compassionate desires. <coughs> and we're familiar with those. We're familiar with compassionate beliefs. We're familiar with compassionate desires. And that just is what the trait of compassion consists of. <coughs> it's identical to, in fact. There's no mystery. I'll give you an illustration diagram of this in a moment to help spell this out more. But that's the monist view. And then there's a dualist view. And you, and you can guess what this says. <coughs> Character traits are metaphysically distinct from underlying dispositions to form beliefs and desires. They're related to uh, beliefs and desires, but they're some, somehow separate from them as well. So the trait of compassion on the dualist view on the right-hand side uh, is not identical to underlying dispositions to form compassionate beliefs and desires. And in general, trait dispositions are not identical to underlying mental state dispositions. That's dualism. Monism, <coughs> take a guess which one view I prefer. <coughs> On the left here, it's the monist view. It's, more simp it's simpler, it's elegant, it's cleaner. It takes away the mystery because you just <coughs> reduce or identify trait dispositions with underlying mental state dispositions. So what compassion is, is just collection of the relevant dispositions to form compassionate beliefs and desires. There's nothing else to the story. Uh, we've uh, taken away the mystery of what character traits are. Of course, it's not that simple, but at least it's a start of taking away the mystery. Why might you not like the dualist position? There's several reasons, and this is a little bit uh, technical, but um, one reason it just it leaves a mystery for you. Again, still, what are these character traits? The second reason is <coughs> overdetermination. Whenever we act in virtue of a character trait on the dualist pos position, <coughs> say in virtue of a desire to relieve the suffering of someone in need, it's going to be the case that both the character trait of compassion and <coughs> the underlying disposition to form compassionate beliefs and desires were both <coughs> causing us to act that way. <coughs> That's a mysterious position. And those of you who are familiar with these ideas from the philosophy of mind uh, will recognize this kind of idea. But it's strange to think that every time we act in a compassionate way, that's in virtue of both <coughs> the trait of compassion causing us to act that way and <coughs> these beliefs and desires also <coughs> causing us to act that way, <coughs> such that each of them by themselves would be sufficient for leading us to act that way. And yet both of them <coughs> are doing the causal work. That's a mysterious uh, picture in my mind. OK, now, now we get to the empirical stuff. OK, psychologists, here we go. This is where I'll get in real trouble. Uh, so now we switch away from metaphysics to empirical issues. So OK, we've talked about how to categorize character traits. We've talked about metaphysically what they might be if they do exist. But then there's a further empirical question. Does anyone actually have them? 
I mean, it might be fun to talk about them in the abstract, to categorize them and so forth, but you know, at the end of the day, I think it's really important to know whether they really exist in this actual world. So on empirical grounds, is there a good reason to believe that most people today have the traditional virtues, so focusing on them for a moment, such as honesty, compassion, and courage, at least to some extent? And according to one view, the answer is yes. Uh, perhaps on, according to these versions of the Big Five model, and according to other views as well, but uh, just to give one illustration, uh, seems like on this way of thinking, most people do have these traits to some degree or other, these, these virtues. But I don't think so. Sorry to get you depressed first thing in the morning. Um, but I think, in fact, the answer is a strong no. The answer is that most people do not, in fact, have the traditional virtues. In fact, they're very, very rare and very difficult to instantiate. Why is that? Well, and how are we going to go about determining that? Well, my approach to thinking about this is to come up with certain standards that a virtue has to meet and then see if those standards are met in the empirical literature. So read a whole bunch of experiments, see what those experiments are telling us uh, about the relevant virtue, and then uh, come to a conclusion to see whether the criteria for possession of that virtue are being met. So give an example of one criteria for compassion. Here's, here's an example. A uh, person who is compassionate when acting in character will typically attempt to help when at the very least the need for help is obvious and the effort involved in helping is very minimal. So just to be clear, this is not a complete story about compassion. There are many, many other criteria that have to be satisfied to be compassionate. For example, a motivational criteria has to be satisfied. This is just one aspect in my mind of what's involved in being a compassionate person. And look, it's a very, very minimal standard here. Not saying you have to help every time, not saying you have to be Peter Singer, or at least follow Peter Singer's philosophy and give away all your money uh, up to the point where you need family relief yourself. None of that. Uh, just when the need for help is obvious and the effort involved in helping is minimal. You gotta at least do that in order to count as compassion. Well, how do people do? Of course, and there's not time for me to go through a whole bunch of studies. Uh, I talk about this a lot in four chapters in the first book, so I, I review a lot of literature on this, but I'll just give you two quick studies. 1972, 85% of controls did not notify a shopper that candy was leaking out of her bag. Something obvious, very easy, would have taken a second or two out of your uh, day uh, to notify this person that something she had just bought uh, was uh, leaking on the ground uh, out of her bag, and yet the vast majority of people didn't do it. 84% of controls did not stop to help pick up dropped cards, another study. Now, of course, this is not meant to convince you of anything. These are just two studies, uh, two specific helping contexts. But if you start getting lots and lots of studies like this, uh, which I think there are, in fact, I think there are hundreds of studies like this, uh, that uh, then the picture looks rather bleak, I think, for most people having the virtue of compassion. Another quick example, honesty. A person who is honest will refrain from regularly cheating in situations where he's free and willing participant and the relevant rules are fair and appropriate, even if by cheating he's assured of some benefit for himself. So again, just one aspect of honesty, not trying to build too much into it, just we got free and willing participants, we got fair rules, you shouldn't cheat, regulate in those situations. But 71% of controls continue taking a test by themselves even after being explicitly instructed at the beginning to stop when a bell rang. So they were said, you take this test for five minutes, the bell's going to ring, and then put your, your pen down and stop taking the test, and then they were left alone. And 71% of them were observed through a two-way mirror to continue going on well past the bell. And then a different, much more recent study that many of you are familiar with, Roughly twice as many problems were solved correctly on the same test when a group of participants had an opportunity to cheat as opposed to another group which did not. So in, this, in a normal version of this, 20 answers. Uh, average for the control group was six answers correct. 
uh, average for the opportunity to cheat group, 13 answers. <coughs> Correct. Is that because the second group was so much smarter? Uh, could be, but I don't think so. Notice it wasn't 20 answers correct. <laughs> Interesting result. They had an opportunity to cheat. They could get away with it completely. They didn't have to worry about being discovered. And they, the average was 13 and not 20. But still, uh, a lot of cheating going on. OK. So that's with respect to virtue. So you might be wondering, well, does that mean we're all pretty crappy people? <laughs> So is this really a depressing story to get you down in the morning? <clears throat> we're all vicious. We've got a dishonesty. We're cruel, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's one uh, inference you might draw. But I don't, well, tip my hand already. Uh, I don't think you have to immediately infer that. Uh, so let's look at the vices. I don't think uh, we have, most people have the vices, just like I don't think most people have the virtues. Can't say much about that here. Uh, say more elsewhere. But just to give you one example, a cruel person, when acting in character, will not first experience significant internal conflict about whether to act cruelly before, in fact, performing cruel actions. You might argue about this or uh, challenge this, but it's at least something to think about. You see, this seems more uh, the, uh, the case for someone who's incontinent uh, in uh, Aristotle's sense, struggling about this, as opposed to someone who's vicious, who has no internal uh, conflict. But again, some more studies. Uh, you all know this one from the famous passage from Milgram about the person who was twitching, <coughs> stuttering wreck uh, at the end of the Milgram experiment. And then in a uh, very interesting uh, uh, modification of the Milgram setup, uh, most participants were in effect willing to ruin an unemployed person's job prospects for the sake of complying with a seemingly legitimate authority. So that looks pretty awful. So maybe they're cruel. but. <coughs> Participants intensely disliked making the stress remarks that they were instructed to do by the authority figure for, uh, in giving this exam to the unemployed person. So they were not uh, wholehearted in doing it. They were incredibly conflicted and very much disliked doing it. So now we're at the end. I think I'm OK. Uh, we started late. Am I OK? Late, yeah. OK. Three minutes. OK. Oh, no. <laughs> Better run then. And rush to it. But we're almost at the end, so I think I'm in good shape. Final issue here. If most people today do not have the traditional virtues and vices, then what is the correct picture of their characters? So if I'm right, just grant me that for a moment for the sake of discussion, then what should we think about most people's character? Well, you could say crude situationism. This is emphasis on crude. It's unclear if anyone actually held this view, but uh, most people do not have any character traits at all whatsoever. You could go that route and just deny the existence of character traits, at least with respect to most people. You could go another route, local traits. Well, they're not these traditional traits like honesty and compassion and courage, which are supposed to be cross-situationally consistent. Instead, we should understand character traits as very narrow dispositions, like honesty just in test-taking situations. Well, that, that wouldn't seem to do so well in the study I gave you, but humility only with your boss, other examples like that. Narrow them down very, uh, very locally. Many of you are working on, on this stuff. Uh, so you'll recognize these two guys, John, uh, John Doris on the right and Gilbert Harmon on the left. They advocate a local trait picture uh, as a competitor to the traditional view about virtues and vices. And so that's, that's the way they go in, uh, in light of this literature. I go different directions. So I say most people have generally morally relevant character traits, contrary to crude situationism. They're not the traditional virtues and vices, contrary to whoever thought most people had the traditional virtues and vices. It's not even clear. Aristotle held that view. I don't think Aquinas held that view either. So if anyone held that view, then I reject it. <coughs> and uh, they are not local traits either. So I part ways with Harmon and Doris. So. What's left? <coughs> I mean, <coughs> there doesn't seem to be any, anything left here. <coughs> so I'll give you a quick <coughs> positive characterization. I say most people have what I call mixed traits <coughs> with some morally positive features and some morally negative features. They're not virtues, they're not vices. <coughs> they're mixed from a moral perspective. These traits can lead us to perform both morally horrendous actions, <coughs> as we've learned from famous studies, 
and also incredibly morally admirable actions, as you know from, say, <coughs> Batson's work on empathy. It's an incredible uh, display of admirable moral behavior uh, in the right uh, situations with the right prompts and inducements. <laughs> so uh, I say most people do have character traits which are robust and influential. I call them mixed traits, and we don't have any names for them. So somehow we've missed them conceptually and terminologically. Uh, they've flown under the radar. And so and we have to come up with names for them uh, and be, understand them a lot better than we have so far. But for more on mixed traits, <coughs> next year. And that's all I'll say for now. Of course, I can say more in the Q&A. Um, but I think my time's up. And <coughs> thanks so much. <coughs> Well, this time we do have about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A, so I'd like to call on members of the audience who have questions. Yes, back there, Mike. Yeah, I just had a question back on the, the point you're in here, <coughs> passion. The, at least the two studies you cite are sort of fairly trivial. Yes. So I'm just wondering if there's studies about people bleeding or in distress yeah. or yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, so that's a common complaint about those particular studies that how, does, how much does this really tell us about a virtue like compassion and if people don't help in these perhaps trivial, perhaps not situations? And the answer is yes, there are other studies where more is at stake. So for example, blood donations, uh, helping people uh, via famine relief. Um, uh, I, I, if, if you give me a minute, I think of other examples. But yes, uh, so I don't think that uh, quite takes care of of the issue. Um, and even in the studies that are cited, some of the behavior is, is fairly disturbing. So uh, if you all know the, um, the phone booth uh, example, so um, Isaac and Levin, uh, the phone booth study where uh, you, make, you, you finish at a phone booth, you leave, you come across someone who's dropped papers, as it turns out to be a confederate of the experimenter, but you don't know that, so the papers are there. Uh, do you help or not? Well, it's somewhat minor, um, but uh, some people would just trample the papers and leave their footprints on the papers. That, that doesn't sound so minor to me. Uh, in the study I did cite with the drop cards, it wasn't just that many people didn't pick up the drop cards, is that many of the participants would make a big path around the cards to avoid them. That doesn't seem quite so trivial to me either. Yeah, thank you. I was just curious, so what's, what's lost in terms of explanation if you don't see a distinction between personality traits and character traits? In terms of explanation? Or, or for, for any purpose. So, so I guess- For any purposes, yes. Yeah. Why, yeah. why do you want to make that distinction? Yeah, yeah, um, good. Uh, I mean, one, one quick answer would be uh, perhaps nothing is lost other than just uh, um, well, I'll give you I'll give you a better answer than I was going to give you. Uh, if you um, think that uh, character traits are something that we should cultivate uh, that are under our control in some sense, something for which we uh, are responsible, then it's worth asking the question whether all personality traits are character traits. Um, because it might turn out that some personality traits are not character traits with respect to those features in, those, in that sense. And so it's a mistake to spend time worrying about cultivating them, worrying about uh, whether people are praiseworthy or blameworthy with respect to those traits. Uh, some traits personality traits might just be out of our control in the sense of control relevant to responsibility. And so we shouldn't, just, we shouldn't even bother going down that path. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Nancy. Thanks for the presentation question. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> we've, we've had this discussion for many years. We <laughs> have, and I'd like to hear you again, because I, um, <laughs> I have a, a different conception of traits in, that, than you do. And, and if you could go back to your, to your slide, on um, an example, lot. compassion, where you, you talk about the um, structure, you know, the trait structure 
Um, I guess in a nutshell, I, there you go. Thank you. I don't think you, your view escapes the charges either of spookiness or of overdetermination. Oh, so okay. I'm still kind of spooked out by it. Okay. Um, <laughs> You're thinking more of this. Um, this but even before, the before, the before then, before then. Okay. Um, because I, you know, I still don't understand why you need disposition. There it is. Oops, sorry. There you go. So here's. Here's the thing, um, you know, my view is more inspired by Michelle's Cap's account of personality. Mm -hmm. And so he's got, I think he's got a view of traits there. And the trait is um, a structure, a stable structure. There's trait structure and processing dynamics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the structure of the trait just is uh, an interlinked set of beliefs and desires yeah. that have been, re you know, activated consistently over time. Yeah. And so you don't have this, this, uh, reference there to a disposition to form beliefs and desires. Uh, and that's what I think is spooky and overdetermined. Uh, so I think the trait just is uh, the stable structure of beliefs and desires which under appropriate stimuli are activated and can then activate related beliefs and desires in uh, the network of traits. Uh, uh, and that just is the trait. Uh, so what what so what yeah, extra work yeah, does yeah, the yeah. disposition do yeah. there? Good, good, good. Um, difficult question. So first of all, I, I don't think that Michelle and I disagree. Uh, so uh, he's been cagey in, in the last 30 years to try and pin down exactly how he understands traits. But I think uh, his most recent work uh, is in line with what I say. Um, and I, so I'm making, for me, it's crucial to focus on the distinction between dispositions to believe and occurrent beliefs. Right. And I don't want to identify traits just with occurrent beliefs and desires. I want to say that there's something more fundamental going on there. So, so that it's true uh, of everyone in this room, perhaps, that they have the trait of compassion, even though right now there's not an opportunity to exhibit it, there's no helping uh, uh, situation at hand. Uh, why is that true? Because everyone, if they have the trait, has this disposition to form these, uh, has the relevant dispositions to form relevant, compassionate beliefs and desires. Um, so I don't see a difference between our views here. Um, I'm not using disposition in any, uh, I don't think, uh, strange sense here. Uh, in, in using it in the exact same sense that I use for my belief about uh, 2 plus 7 equal 9, equaling okay. 9. So the, so the disposition here just for you is the structure. You could, you could call it that, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. OK, I feel better. OK, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good. Uh, yes. yes, over there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. okay. Thanks for that presentation, Christian. I, you know, I, I've, I've always been fascinated how social psychologists have used those data, that, some of which you described, on how people can act in a way that's less than moral or that shows mm -hmm. a lack of character. Mm -hmm. So, but you could also use many examples where you show that people can act honorably. Absolutely. So, what? Here's my question for you. Those studies show that people can act in a way that's less than moral. Yes. Why should we presume that that generalizes to how people do act, given that we can have many examples, also counterexamples, of how people can act very honorably? Mm -hmm. So like, for example, uh, those, those weren't random samples of the population. And so when you want to ask the question, does something occur, you need, at a minimum, a random sample of that broader population uh, to which you want to generalize. Mm -hmm. So why, why should we presume that these, the answer to can something occur generalizes to how people will behave or how something does occur. Okay, uh, that's, that's great. A um, lot, 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 lot to say about that. Um, so first, let me acknowledge some limitations. The studies that were mentioned here and that I tend to focus on uh, are studies conducted in the West, typically with a certain familiar population of college students and so forth, and so I am nervous about generalizing too far here. Uh, I certainly don't want to generalize uh, without appropriate evidence to, uh, to China or to uh, India or, so, or other population groups. Uh, certainly even in the case of, uh, in the West, non-student populations, I'm nervous about generalizing too far there too. Um, but on the other hand, I am maybe more optimistic about what these studies show than, than you are. Uh, so I, I entirely agree there are lots of studies finding admirable behavior, lots of studies finding not so admirable behavior. That's why I don't infer 
<coughs> that most people have the vices. <coughs> so I think just as much, just as there's a lot of evidence that don't people, people don't have the virtues, there's lots of evidence that people don't have the vices either. <coughs> and so that's why I go in a, in a middle of the road direction. <coughs> people have character traits which are mixed with some positive moral features, some negative moral features, in certain circumstances can lead them to behave quite admirably, in others quite dishonorably, to use your expression. Um, that's, that's the initial answer, but, but do you want to follow up? Well, when you, as you're saying that, um, when I'm, well, I'm not talking about other cultures or anything like that. I'm saying even there was the samples that you described were never intended to generalize to any particular group. They were simply, those studies simply addressed, can something occur? Because they were, you can't generalize to any group, actually. You know what I'm saying? Not even to Western groups. Because no Western group was, people from that group were not chosen at random from a Western group. See what I'm saying? So, so they, they merely can answer the question, can people behave in a way that's less, that falls short of some standard? So, so, um, so I, I agree, I can't infer from what's true of 50 subjects to what's true of people in the West in general. Sure, <clears throat> but many of these studies uh, used, uh, I mean, so Milgram, for example, he didn't just use college students. I mean, he had a wide variety of different participants in his, in his uh, various studies. Uh, seems like he's shown us something about how many people are disposed to be. <clears throat> and that, that generalizes beyond the specific context of his laboratory environment. Uh, that seems like we can infer from that that people are surprisingly disposed to uh, obey authority figures, even at the expense of some of their deepest moral commitments. So <clears throat> that's, that's pretty powerful evidence in my mind. Well, I'm sorry to say this, uh, but we are out of time. Um, but this is a two-day <clears throat> wow. conference. And, uh, I'll be sure to track Christian down for you if you want to ask your question. Oh, no. <laughs> um, but uh, we do need to end. Even though we started five minutes late, we ended about five minutes late. So we do need to end at this point. Thank you so much, and uh, happy to talk more.